Hello everyone, and welcome back to those of you who've been with the channel for a while. Today I'm going to show you my process for speed painting World War II US Army infantrymen. This same general process can apply to pretty much any infantry you want to paint for science fiction, history, or whatever other settings that you're looking at, as long as you pick out a fairly limited palette of colors and you're able to just run through things, uh, you know, in a fairly assembly line manner, which is quite appropriate to the US Army of World War II. If this interests you at all, let's carry on to the first step, which is actually preparing the models for painting. I like to give all of my models a quick little bath in some soapy water before actually painting them, but that's especially important if you are going to be using metal models like this. These ones have definitely been bathed off before being used. This will help make sure that your paints stick very well to your models when you actually paint them. For bases, I'm going to be using washers. I've got some small diameter washers that came with the actual models in this commission, but for my own part, when I went out shopping, the cheapest and most effective washers I could find were these with a large inner diameter. As you can see, the model won't properly sit over and cover the entire gap in the center of the washer, so we'll have to do something to fill that in. Fortunately, it's very simple and cheap. I'm just going to use some thin cardboard. Thin cardboard may seem a little flimsy at first glance, but pretty much anything is quite rock solid once you've coated it in super glue. So I'm going to cut out some strips of this, just the right width to be covering up that inner diameter of my washers, and just get some squares that are going to seat my models over top of that hole. It's not important to be too exact here, especially if you're going to be using a thick gel super glue like I am, because that can be used to cover up any little gaps that you get around the sides. If you make it too small though, you'll still end up with a hole and that's not going to help you, and if you make it too large, the corners might uh, push off the edges of the washer and you'll end up with a little bit of a lip that you don't necessarily want. Before actually trying to glue anything down, I'm just going to take a metal file and just file down the top surface of these washers. This is to scrape away at any galvanized coating and also roughen up the surface, giving the glue some more texture to grab onto and helping everything stick together. With this gel super glue, I'm able to just squeeze out a whole lot of it and make a thick surface across the bottom of the cardboard here. That's going to, when it dries, make the cardboard extremely solid, and also sort of semi-waterproof the bottom layer that's actually going to be sticking out through the hole in the washer. The edges of the cardboard with the super glue on them are going to glue to the actual washer at the corners, and that's going to create a really strong bond that covers up the base and helps our models stay standing on these heavy bases for longer. While I normally base on plastic bases, metal miniatures on washers does make a little bit of sense in terms of moving the center of gravity down and making far more stable models, and that is the case with these models. Given that it's a whole army of metal models, basing them on metal makes a lot of sense in my opinion. For basing materials, just to add some texture, I'm also going to have some cat litter, not used, and some baking soda. The cat litter acts as small pebbles and gravel on the bases, whereas the baking soda gives a fine, sandy, dirty sort of texture. You could use just straight up sand if you wanted to, something for a sandbox or something from the beach, but this will give you a far grittier texture than might be appropriate at the scale of the miniatures. It's a question of taste. Some of these washers have also already had things glued to them. Uh, in this case, it's the models from the commission. So I'm going to sand away any super glue residue that's on the washer in order to make a smooth surface that the models can stick to. When applying super glue now, I apply it in a thick layer all over the washer, not just where I'm sticking the model down. The super glue is going to be holding the basing texture in place as well. The baking soda in particular acts as a catalyst for super glue, setting it up fairly quickly and making that sort of rough texture stay, giving us a bit of an interesting ground surface for our miniatures. With the cardboard here, again, we've got an exposed cardboard face that we want to keep strong, so make sure you apply quite a lot of super glue over top, and it'll make a nice rocky surface that will certainly not fall apart on you. With that all covered in super glue, it's just a question of making sure the bases of the models are flat so that they stand up straight. Uh, sometimes there can be sprue or other materials on the bottom, so just make sure none of that is there. Press them down into the super glue, and you should find they stand up fairly easily. Now for the actual texturing, there's a couple of things you're going to want to remember. First of all is to put the cat litter on before the baking soda. Baking soda, since it acts as a catalyst for the superglue, will set the superglue up and turn it hard, so anything you put on afterwards will not stick down. We're using the baking soda here to hold the model and the texture in place afterwards, as well as adding a little bit of texture to the superglue. The second thing to remember is that these cat litter pebbles are made of clay, which means if you use some sort of white glue, PVA glue, or other water-based glue, you're actually going to soften the cat litter and it's going to become crumbly and weak. This can be a bit of a delayed problem because after you paint everything, you may just rub your thumb against it and tear up a piece of your base because the cat litter has crumbled underneath. You definitely want to watch out for this and use the right materials. 
That being said, if you're working with this much superglue, wear a mask. The fumes can become irritants after a while and you don't want to develop uh, an intolerance for superglue if you're in the modeling hobby. Once you're done, tap off all of the extra baking soda from the bases, and if there are any of the lips showing, either from the actual model's bases or from the cardboard that we applied to cover up the holes in the washers, go in with a little more super glue over top and on the edges, and you can use that baking soda that you tapped off earlier to just fill those areas in, dribbling it on over top and solidifying your uh, little dots of super glue. Once again, a strong gel super glue is far preferable to a liquid super glue for this job because it keeps it a little bit of a shape and it helps hold things in place a little bit uh, better, I find. So I'm a strong fan of the gel super glue if you can get it. Once that's done, you can just tap everything off again, and if you work on a mat like I do and not directly on your work service or table or whatever, you can pour off any excess. Baking soda and cat litter are pretty cheap materials, but being thrifty is what means you can spend a little more money on models and paints later. So, I keep everything in these little containers and I try to reuse as much as I can. A little bit of cat litter in the baking soda isn't going to hurt, they're going to the same place anyway. Once the models are based up, you're going to want some way to hold them while you go through the priming and painting process so that you can get around the edges of the base, especially with these washers, more coverage, especially with your primer, is pretty useful. To do that, I use my homemade painting grips. I actually have a video, the link is going to be in the card right now. Uh, if you want to go check that out to make these yourself, they're made with very, very cheap dollar store and art store ingredients, and it's just a very quick way to hold a model up and support it so that you can get at all edges of it and all angles of it while you're painting. This next bit involves using an airbrush. If you don't have an airbrush, a lot of these materials can be added by hand, but uh, I do prefer the airbrush. Thin coats, especially in this early stage, are quite effective at uh, preserving a lot of the surface details so that your painting later on can be much easier than if you're trying to paint these details on by hand over top of lumps and lumps of uh, lower coats. My preferred primer is the Vallejo Black Surface Primer. This gives a really even bottom coat and shrinks even after being applied so that everything just looks shrink wrapped and the detail is preserved perfectly. It can be applied with a brush, but be careful of adding air bubbles if you do so. Next, I apply some Vallejo White Model Air from above for a zenithal highlight. This is as much to show through the later layers as it is just to help me see the detail, give it a little bit of contrast, because all black it's very very hard to see where the lips and edges between different surfaces are. By applying the zenithal highlight though, I can now see everything and paint around it far more effectively. You can do this by just dry brushing from top to bottom across a model uh, with a standard brush using white paint if you do want to do it that way. The last thing I'm going to want to do here is just apply a bit of a base color across everything. All of the tones on the US Army infantry sort of scheme are fairly earth tone or earth tone adjacent. So just adding a base color of brown ink with my airbrush, so again it's thin, over top of everything just means that if I do miss some corners because I'm speed painting these guys, it's not going to be immediately obvious because it's not going to be pure black, it's not going to be white, it's going to be a warm tone matching everything else. For the actual base colors, there's a very small palette I use, it's going to show up on screen right now, just showing the colors, Vallejo paints and inks, that I use, and uh, cheap white and black acrylic. I use a really cheap brush here, this one I actually cut the ends of the bristles off because they got stuck together, so it's kind of weird and curvy and thick, but it takes on a lot of paint and allows me to apply it very, very quickly. That's perfect for this stage because I'm trying to be kind of sloppy and just lay in base colors across the entire model very quickly. Starting with the medium brown here, I'm trying to represent sort of the brown wool trousers of the GI. I ended up doing a little bit of research into the uniforms, as well one should when doing this kind of thing, without getting too caught up on the details. <laughs> it did lead me into a bit of a rabbit hole on uh, how the uniforms were changing for GIs throughout the war fairly quickly, and some things were not necessarily immediately evident. For example, the 1943 jacket didn't make it to the Americans in Normandy in 1944 until later, after D-Day, so... <laughs> All that being said, pick the colors that suit you best based on whatever reference photo you find and apply them thinly. I'm using model air paints here. These are airbrush paints rather than standard normal brush paints. This means they're pre-thinned and go on very lightly and are very easy to apply without being so thin that they run everywhere and leave all of the raised areas uncovered. You can see that it's uh, giving me a pretty even coat looking at those trousers that have already dried and uh, it bases over top of this brown really, really nicely. Uh, I didn't have to go in for a second coat on any of this, although you'll see later we're going to fix any areas where it did end up thin anyway, so a second coat would have been 
redundant to say the least considering this is supposed to be an efficient speed painting process. In terms of what's actually happening on screen, I'm now using the gray-green paint as a substitute for an olive drab, sort of. Going over the brown, it uh, dries out to a pretty nice color that, I, in my opinion, fairly well represents olive drab for the 1941 Parsons jacket that our uh, gentlemen are wearing here. And then I can go in with NATO green as a khaki green for doing belt webbing and helmets, mainly. Again, there's a little bit of a contention here between my reference photos in terms of what might be the appropriate color for different elements of the webbing, for example, but green seems appropriate for most of them, and part of the decision in miniature painting, in my opinion, is trying to create a good piece of art as well as creating a good representation of history, which is to say, I want to create contrast and I want these miniatures to look good on the tabletop, especially if we're talking about speed-painted miniatures actually meant for use in gameplay. If I were to go in and do every little detail and make them very, very good for up-close viewing, for example, you know, as a display piece, I might do things a little differently, but in this case, where things are going to be seen from the tabletop and I need them to be readily identifiable, I want them to look good, I'm picking authentic things based on reference images that I have found, and I'm mixing them in such a way so that there are different bands of color that clearly represent the different parts of the model, and make it look more like a human from a distance. Here now, I'm going to use medium brown and white acrylic. This is just the cheap Artist Loft white acrylic. It's the no-name brand from my local art store, as far as I can tell. And I'm getting a paler, sort of tan color that I'm going to apply to the gaiters on the models in particular, as well as the packs that carry their entrenching tools. Uh, all of those are being picked out in this exact same pale tan color. And I'm going to go in and do things like their slings as well afterwards. If you've been watching a lot of my more recent videos, especially Volodyovsky, the one that's kicked off the year basically on this channel, you'll know that I'm fairly interested in mixing my own paints wherever possible. I think this is pretty important for me in terms of my learning process as a miniature painter to sort of get a better understanding of my palette, mix my own paints, see how things come together and how to make sort of matching tones, good contrast, that kind of stuff. But when you're working on a quick project like this where you're trying to speed paint through an entire army of models, Using a name brand paint can be a pretty good idea in terms of making sure you get the same color across all of the models. That being said, mixing it still is quite useful if you can, for example, to get this pale color, because you want to stretch those name brand paints as much as possible. They can be quite expensive, in my opinion, for what is effectively just a quick shortcut in terms of matching your paints. The slings and the entrenching tool holders are done up in this same light brown, and then we can move on from this to the next color, which is actually, getting a little more interesting, the wood, which is a mixture of a medium brown and red. I'm doing this to just make the brown stocks of rifles, the entrenching tools, and also the leather on the boots just pop out a little bit from the other colors. Giving it a little bit of warmth is kind of interesting. In my opinion, it helps it look like the varnished wood that was common in the stocks of weapons back then, and just gives it a little bit of detail compared to everything else rather than doing it with just a normal brown. Again, mixing out your colors wherever possible but in ways that are predictable to you. Um, these mixes of white and brown and red and brown, I do them basically one dip of the brush into each and make it 50-50 in terms of the mixture so that these are easily replicable across the entire army even though I am speed painting multiple models. And it just means I can get a little bit of color variation out of a fairly small selection of actual premium paints. That being said, as I showed in my indefatigable video, the one that just came out, premium paints are also worth it for more than just their specific colors. Uh, their, their texture and such are definitely worth having in the right situation. The next step is the actual flesh now. So I'm using medium flesh tone from Vallejo and my red India ink mixed together to get more of a pink color. Their medium flesh tone is a little weird to me. Um, I'm not sure if any of you know why, but it's like particularly beige, I guess, rather than being pink. And especially for a base color, I'd rather the skin be a little pinker in order to show that sort of the blood vessels underneath that warmth of skin. Whereas if it were just yellow with a brown over top, I think the faces would look jaundiced really, or um, just a little sickly rather than uh, the, the sort of warm human faces that I'm going for. Now I'm going to mix my own wash here for putting over top of them. I don't use commercial washes because I just, I often find they're a little too strong, they're a little too, I don't like their texture, whatever. 
I, I, I'm at that stage in learning to paint where I want to mix my own stuff and know my own things. So that's where I'm at now. I mixed together some brown India ink, some black India ink, a lot of water, and a few drops of a Vallejo Airbrush Flow Improver because it just breaks up the surface tension of the wash a little bit, helps it flow into crevices without leaving tide marks, and also it acts as a very, very mild paint thinner. This can be a good thing and a bad thing. In the good sense, it can actually blend together the edges of paints underneath the wash, just very slightly, which is nice. But on the downside, if you brush it around too much when you're applying the wash, you'll actually strip paints from below uh, the wash, which is not what you want to do at all. So when you're applying this wash, go on really heavily and only hit an area once, twice, whatever. Spread the wash around, but don't brush it into corners. Dab it on if you can. This kind of wash that I'm applying here is pretty weak. It shows up very dark in the darkest of crevices, but otherwise doesn't darken the actual surface color, the base colors of the model all that much. Um, some of the other washes I've tried from more commercial sources uh, change your base colors significantly. Um, and I think part of that, it can be quite nice. I've seen some great videos of people using that to good effect to get that sort of grim dark style, quote unquote, um, make things look a little dirty or whatever. But uh, I find, uh, yeah, they, they look dirty, I guess. Um, so when I try to do my models, I don't want them to look dirty. I want them to look expressly painted because the dirt, while it looks great again at uh, an individual level, a display level, a photography level, um, when it's done very, very well like they do, I find on the tabletop could make things look a little bit muddy. And that's just my opinion, and I'm still learning painting actively. Uh, that's part of the point of having Jacques of All Games, the YouTube channel, is to uh, sort of track my progress and track projects that I do. So, you know, if you're following along, uh, hopefully you'll sympathize with that, and you'll find that, yeah, this wash, this approach here, lightly darkening things and just giving me a little bit more of a shadow in the crevices that helps hide the transitions between colors that I applied very rapidly earlier. I like the look of it, I think it works well, but of course it needs to be fixed afterwards because it's still a wash that just, the transitions get a little deep and it does affect the surface colors of your base areas a little bit. I'm using a finer pointed brush here than I used before because now I want to get into more detail. And now I'm just going to go over every area with the exact same paint that I used previously as the base color, but I'm going to stick only to the highest areas. So what we should have now is a transition between the dark brown wash in the deepest crevices, the slightly darker base color where the wash covered a raised area but then flowed away from it, and then the actual base co color that we're applying now on top of all of the most raised and highest areas on the models. This will give us a really nice three-tone transition easily for the sake of painting only two tones, um, which is kind of the nicest part about this technique. Despite having speed painted things on, it'll still come off as having a little bit of complexity of color and depth. And having made sure that I used a brown wash over top of relatively brown colors with a brown base coat underneath, everything is tied together in tone. And that is a very, very nice in my opinion. It keeps everything cohesive. For the helmets here, I try to leave that strip around the edges so that you get that relief of the helmet, the sort of shape of it implied by the shading. I think that's really important there as well. I do pay a lot of attention closer to the face and that kind of area. You want that to be the focal point of the model because it's kind of where the human eye is drawn to in any case. So having stuff around the face and the head bright and putting just a little bit more attention in there is uh, very effective in terms of making the miniatures look good uh, when you're playing or when you're displaying them. In all cases, you're noticing it probably the most here on the gators, I'm trying to make sure that my highlights are sort of streaky or in lines, uh, and I keep those lines in the direction of the fabric or whatever surface they're going onto. This gives the impression of ripples and texture on top of the, uh, the miniature, basically on the surface, that may not actually be there necessarily in part of the sculpting. Although on the trousers in particular, there's already really good wrinkles in the cloth, so I can just follow those with my lines as I did when I was doing the trousers, and you can see it gives really nice depth to the actual colors. The depth looks a little intense from up close here, maybe, but on the tabletop, it looks great and gives a lot of sort of 3D, uh, if that makes sense, despite the fact that these are 3D models. It gives a lot of 3D sort of feel to them, making it look like there's a lot more going on with them. The wood part here, again, I'm just using that red and brown color and going over the wood areas. This is probably the one where I'm least concerned about sticking to any particular texture, and I'm actually going to cover the whole thing in it. I want the wood in particular, on both the entrenching tool and the weapons, to look fairly smooth across the entire surface. On the boots, you can stick to the toes and heels where maybe the boots would be more scuffed up. <laughs> 
As I move to working on the jacket here, you can see once again I'm trying to keep it into lines and streaks, keeping to raised areas but trying to imply wrinkles and creases in the fabric. I'm also definitely trying to make sure that I leave a little bit of the original base coat in between any area that I'm highlighting and any dark recesses where the wash pooled. This helps create a three-tone sort of transition that's smooth looking at a distance instead of being a hard, light color to dark color sort of line. Now for the flesh tones, I'm using the same mix as before, but with a little bit of white mixed in this time. Just the flesh tone, the red ink, and then the cheap white acrylic paint. I wanted to lighten it up a little bit because just the straight up sort of dark red pink that I had before wouldn't have looked quite so good as a highlight, whereas this paler color looks great. Aim for stuff like the cheekbone, the nose, the upper lip, the jawbone, and the tips of the ears to just pick those out and give the shape of a face at a distance. Again, as I mentioned, the face is a focal point, so put in a little more time here just to make sure they look good when you're looking at them from the tabletop. It's going to add a lot to your army. For flocking now, I use a flock mixture that's composed of a little bit of static grass and I think medium and light green from Woodland Scenics, and some oregano for fallen leaves, and dill for fallen sticks and twigs. I apply it with Mod Podge glue because Mod Podge glue dries very, very clear. Um, I've had some issues with other PVA glues where they dried cloudy and, uh, you know, yes, quote unquote translucent, uh, I get it, but uh, that doesn't look very good. So I want to make sure that it's very, very clear, so I use a slightly higher quality glue here, and that's Mod Podge for me. I apply this fairly liberally across the base, although if there are some pebbles, some of the cat litter rocks that you want to keep showing, you may want to just avoid those and then it'll give a little more of a rougher texture to the base of the uh, model. Applying the flock itself, I grab a big clump of it and I just tap it on. Tapping it on helps me push it down into the glue to make sure I'll get good adhesion. It also helps some of the uh, strands sort of stick upwards and outwards of the glue instead of just sprinkling it on and letting them fall flat. Going around the edges here, I just want to make sure the edges are clear, and the tapping motion is also helping me tap off any extra flock that may be on there and not stuck down. So I'm just wiping and tapping at the same time all the way around the miniature. Now I apply a matte varnish through my airbrush, but again, you can probably apply this in different ways. I haven't really tried it with a brush, you just want to make sure you don't put it on too thick, um, because otherwise it gets cloudy. With the matte varnish now applied, I'm going to take some black flow acrylic and some gunmetal paint to do the actual gunmetal parts of the models. Because this metallic paint has a little bit of a shine on it, I need to do it after the matte varnish, not before. Because if you do it before the matte varnish, then the matte varnish makes everything matte and takes the shine out of things. So your metallic paints just become gray. Um, I want this also to be very, very dark. So a lot of black to the gunmetal. This means that it's not going to be shining and reflecting. It's just going to have a little bit of an edge highlight that makes it imply maybe it's scuffed metal rather than just perfectly blued metal because weapons would have bluing on them to prevent reflection. They shouldn't really shine at all, but bluing gets uh, chipped and worn away pretty quickly. So for the weapons to not have any shine isn't quite accurate either in my opinion. Plus the shine makes them look better at a distance anyway. So with this very, very dark mixture of gunmetal and black paint, I'm going in over all of the metallic bits, including buttons on any of the backpacks, uh, the canteen lids, and just little details like that in order to just add a little bit more relief to the model. If you're not a fan of using metallic paint because you still find it looks a little too shiny or something, I have also seen examples of people applying just a black or dark dark blue paint across uh, metallic areas like the firearms that shouldn't necessarily be shiny, and then using the graphite of a pencil to rub over them and give them a little bit of a gloss, so you might want to try that. Around the edges of the base here, I just apply another coat of primer. Uh, the primer sticks on best out of everything and also has a nice semi-gloss finish, so that just works out for me. Normally I would use the flow acrylic on plastic bases, but because these metal bases, or the metal washers really, do have some issues with paint adhesion sometimes, it does make a little bit of sense to go in with another layer of primer and just bind everything down. Ideally, I have wiped away most of the flock that was along the edges earlier when I was wiping and tapping during the actual flocking process, but if there was any in the way, I just paint over it and it becomes part of the edge of the model. And that's that. This is six models finished in one hour of actual painting time, not counting drying time, so I'd consider that speed painting. And at this pace you can pick up an army for chain of command or bolt action or something like that very, very quickly, saving yourself a little bit of time to work on personalities like officers, leaders, uh, heroes, that kind of stuff, if you do want to. This same technique can be applied to any army, science fiction, historical, or whatever, as long as you get a good idea of the scheme you want and try to break it down to its fundamental colors.
If you can work with just a few colors, mixing them only occasionally, you can make sure that you're getting a consistent color scheme across the entire army and make sure that things go very quickly. I also recommend you do try mixing your own wash at least once. A lot of store-bought washes are not only expensive, but they also give you no control really over the consistency, the makeup, and the color of it, unless you end up buying several different washes of several different colors. And having a wash that matches the overall color of your model is very, very important to getting a good sort of tied together look to it. If you have a model that's all blue and you wash it in black or brown, you'll get shading, but you'll get shading that looks a little cartoonish and stands out quite a lot from the model, whereas if you were to wash it in a dark, dark blue, uh, sort of the same wash as I made here using a mixture of black and blue and then watering it down and thinning it significantly, you'll get a much more cohesive model. So if you take anything away from this, I recommend you take that away and give it a shot sometime. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you learned something. If you do try out any of the techniques that I showed off in this video, let me know down in the comments. I'm interested to see if you got any questions about these sort of techniques or any comments, any requests for uh, things to show later on on this channel. Definitely let me know down in the comments. Thank you all for your engagement and thank you for your support so far. And as usual, go play some games.